Laughing Monkey Music Tale. Today we have a great drummer, Chad Wackerman. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Sean? Doing good. I'm doing good. Are you, I think earlier, you're the fabric of my life, like a lot of musicians, like you, because you've played with so many, so many musicians. Oh, wow. you're, yeah, right. Well, you're such a fantastic uh, a drummer. And um, thank you. What I want to say is, is I heard of you, and it's funny, the same thing, it was the same way I heard of um, got into Frank's music was through Dweezil. Being at the age of 52, okay, I listened to Dweezil's album. I knew of who Frank was. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, Frank is a huge part of my life now, like everybody else. We're, we're talking about Frank Zappa, if somebody who doesn't course, know. Is, is <laughs> they probably all know, channel, doesn't know on your who show. Frank Zappa is, right? You should probably just turn off the, the radio. Um, but uh, <laughs> there's only one Frank. Um, I guess Frank's alone, but, you know. Um, but at that point. Frank Sinatra, um, yeah, okay. Oh, Frank Sinatra, that's a good one. Yep, my bad. I stepped back from that. If yeah, he, people good. say Frank, you know, he, you're depending right. on what, he, what your yeah, age and era. Great. Yeah, no, it's fine. Yeah, I, you just served me up. All right. Um, <laughs> no. Whack him in one. Um, but to that point, no. like, I, you know, I knew uh, Frank. I thought I was such a jazz guy. I really was listening to a lot of metal back then. And you, I didn't have as much options of music. So I heard Dweezil. And then, of course, with Dweezil's album, you were on it. So to me, I was one of you. first record, record, yeah. Having a... Right. Which is amazing. You know, and then of course, you, you all your stuff you've done. And I, as I relearned, as I learned Zappa, Frank Zappa, you know, the whole world opened up to me of your drumming, you know, and, and it's fantastic. Oh, um, well, well, thank you. I mean, you had many, he had so many great musicians and so many great drummers over the years of his, his bands. You know, it was just an honor to be, to be in the band. There's a lineage to it, I think, like because it affects everybody. It's almost like it is. It's like it's like a music school for a lot of people. I, you know, I've actually spoken to people who've been in the band on some level. You know, uh -huh. where it shapes them. Usually, the first or two albums they do afterwards. We can talk. We'll, we'll go back and forth. But like your first album, you did outside of Zappa. Do you felt like you were it was you were really playing so Zappa in your mindset, or had it evolved into your playing differently? You know what I'm saying? It's a really good question. Um, so, but I don't. Like, like Steve Vai's first album. It's, it's hard. It really felt like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, Flexible. I, I yeah. played on a, a few tracks on yeah. Flexible. Um, yeah, I think Steve's stuff was more direct, probably. I mean, of course, I mean, the, um, when I did my first record, I um, Alan Holdsworth was playing guitar on it, you know, yep. so, oh. and Jim Cox and, and Jimmy Johnson, all monsters. Yeah. And. Uh, so maybe, I don't know, maybe, you know, there's probably some stuff you could probably point to a little bit, but I, I don't think it sounds like, no, I don't think it sounds like a Zappa record. Um, if anything, so those, all those people have such huge musical personalities, you know, right. they brought their own. Well, I wrote yeah. these compositions and we did half on that record, half the songs were improvisations. So you, you're really hearing them, you know, especially in an improvisation because they're not you're not tied to a, uh, a form or a composition or, uh, but then the other half of the tunes were. So um, you, you could probably point to some, some of the odd time things, maybe yeah. a little bit zappish, but it, I wasn't trying to, uh, certainly not copy, copy. No, or, no, I don't or, mean copy. I just felt like something go, or go that there. added to your, added to your palette because you were. Well, I think were organically like, it happens, yeah. you know, anytime you work with such as, I mean, I was such fortunate to work with such a strong, musical composer a strong leader you know and yeah, same thing I mean, stuff rubs off on you it doesn't mean you're uh, you know you just try to take it all in so uh, well, you, what, but, what you brought but, into his band though is, is important to, to zap his band your playing was phenomenal because you were doing so many other orchestras and big bands type of stuff which you brought in yeah i think added to the band you know because there was a great drummer before you so you had to bring something that's a little bit different in too you know well, he allowed that too. Um, he wanted, when I did get the audition, he he told me, you know, he gave me a, like 10 albums and he, he said, you know, memorize these, <laughs> you know, in three weeks we start rehearsing. We'll start there, then it'll be, there'll be a lot more. We'll, I'll change up all the arrangements, but, but start here. Um, but he said, don't copy these drummers that are on the record. I said, I want you to bring your you know, not exact words, but like bring yourself into it, you know, personality. He allowed, uh, yeah, he, he wanted, he said, yeah, put your, your personality into, into this, 
you know, so which was a a relief <laughs> because it's you can't really <laughs> truly sound like somebody else. And and these are you know the greatest drummers in the world was Vinnie Colaiuta and Terry Bozio oh, and and right. you know Chester Thompson, Ralph Humphrey. I mean all these um, records before me. So yeah, so it was a big relief, but then what an opportunity too, you know. So and then you start to. <laughs> Um, you probably start to think, I probably start to think a little bit, okay, well, what is me? Like, what do I do this maybe a little bit unique mm -hmm. and then try to grow that, you know? And, I mean, some, some stuff needs to be more pedestrian just because it's a, could be a, a metal song or something. You need to play a certain beat. That's, right. I'm totally fine with that. But um, with fills, unless they're part of a hook of a tune, it's really up to me, you know? And, um, with student, I teach as well. So with students, I try to get them to think about those transition moments, like your drum fills, where you know you don't have to play the same fill every time. If you figure out what that drum fill is doing for the music, it's us usually taking the music from, say, a verse to a chorus, or a chorus mm -hmm. to a guitar solo, or a guitar solo, or or the double chorus. You're you're kind of driving the tune, and if you think more in that way, if you figure out. The, the fill that works really well, why does it work? Well, it's, maybe it has a crescendo in it. Maybe it starts slow and goes faster. Maybe it's more exciting at the beginning and brings the whole band down to a verse again. So, you know, once you start thinking a little bit wider, you can get out of your rut and bring bring in more personality. And then the other you... thing with pers personality, I noticed that, uh, especially working with Alan Holdsworth for so long, I worked with him for about, on and off, but um, probably over a 30 year period, um, he was constantly just getting rid of cliches, you know, so he would, he would stop doing certain things, uh, like, like if it was a recognizable pattern or a guitar lick or something, if you heard somebody else do it, you'd never hear him do that again. He just <laughs> would not. He thought I love was, Alan. I love his stuff. He is fantastic. Yeah, so. it, you know, for him, he was really hard on himself. He wanted to be creative. And, uh, was he ever he felt, happy? Did he ever go, God, that was a good day. That was a good riff. Did he ever like really feel like he scored and not just, all right. He was very humble and uh, didn't have a big ego. So, um, no, but like, so like pride, like, yeah, I finally did what yeah, I wanted. Like, you know what I'm saying? You know, we, we, in the early days, especially we used to tape, you know, we would tape, our, tape the gigs just from the right. stage. Um, once in a while, get a board tape, but they would never sound very good. Um, <laughs> Well, because it's all the, the stuff you're not hearing from the right, stage. Right, it's not mixed down. Also. It's not you know, even mixed so, down. It's just raw. Like board tapes have really loud vocal and very, you know, very little yeah. bass, or, you know, or, or no guitar. Uh, so I would just, you know, I'd usually have a cassette player or something and, and tape it. And once in a while, once in a great while, Alan said, that that was all right. That, that was all right last night. <laughs> then everybody would be like, where's the tape? <laughs> Let's check it out, you know. <laughs> but that's as kind of as, as a... I hear that so yeah. much about him. Like, you know, what I mean, like he's people have seen him play with him. Like, great people. So, like, they're like, I can't believe how he played that night. And he'll come off stage going, "Man, I really messed that up." And it's uh, like, yeah, and be depressed. Yeah, like I'm like, I'm like, oh, well, I felt yeah, good. His... it was good. No ego, but just like that was good. I feel like I did a good job. That was good. I'm happy. You know. Yeah, he I don't hear those stories a lot. Where he felt he felt like he needed to improve all the time, where he was disappointing people. Like every record, the solos needed to be more creative or more or better. Um, which is he did, he was insane. really hard on himself and and not hard on the band he didn't have the same attitude he he would be like oh, i love what you're doing or you know he would never um never really tell us what to do yeah cuz he didn't like being in the past he was in a couple bands uh, or at least one where um they were very directive to his his here is the part here play this part and okay you know, I don't think they asked him to play a solo the same on the record, but um, he really didn't enjoy that and, and thought it was the handcuffs were on too much, you know, so so he didn't want to be that kind of leader. So his idea was that you, you get people, you choose musicians very carefully, but you, you get players that bring something you, you really enjoy mm -hmm. to your music. Without, That's a drummer. You're without, the leader, though, on without, some level. You know without, what I mean? So it's important. Well, well, I think as a drummer, you have you have a whole lot of power to shape the music. More, 
more than anybody else. I mean, and uh, you know, sometimes I do. I'll even do. A, well, people send me will send me tracks, and and sometimes they're even like just very static MIDI tracks, and they're going to put everything else on top later, or they're going to replace the synthesizers with guitars, or the, you know, but it's some of the some of the stuff can sound really machine like and, and strict but when you put drums on top of it, it you can give the impression that the stuff breathes yeah that it has a you know the, the the music has shape to it even though the other instruments are very static even at, at that point so, um with some students it takes them a while to figure that out that they actually do have that much um, influence on the band especially live you know mm -hmm. So. Oh, yeah, especially live with speeding and timing. And that song's like two and a half minutes. It's usually a lot longer. <laughs> well, you yeah, or even pace. if you decide to like the last chorus, if you really want to give it, uh, you know, a lot more energy, the, the band's going to go with you. You know, if you decide to no, like bring that last chorus down, which is unusual, but, but typically they're not going to just blast through it. You know, you, you do seem to have more control. Even if the guitar player can play louder than you can, you know, it's it's not a volume thing. It's I don't I don't know what it is. Maybe it's tribal or something. <laughs> uh, drums. Well, with, like with metal fatigue and stuff, how is that like in the in the writing and the and like in the drums and forming of that? Did you have any? Um, so so metal control? fatigue was the second album that I played on with Alan. Um, it, it was vinyl, you know, originally I love, cassette. I love, uh, um, yeah. I played on one half of the record, and Gary Husband, amazing musician, played on the other half. We both used to tour with Alan, so I think he wanted um, he wanted both of us on the record. So you know, if so, you'll yeah. do it live. It might be Gary, it might be me. It was all fine. Um, it that record was a a, a a demo. I mean, the the half that I played on was a demo for the record company to try to get the record deal. Really, and he said, you know the. I like the bass and drums. I'm just going to keep it. <laughs> Jimmy and I are like, <laughs> you sure? <laughs> but we listened back to that. Well, that's, it's, that's all right. I might have done, you know, we, we were planning on doing it again. But then that's the day I realized there's no more demo. There's no more demos. Yeah. You always have to play like this is the final. Even if they say this, well, this is just going to be a demonstration recording. No. Too, I, th I think a lot of people... Um, you know, if you were a fan of rock stuff, you or songs, you were, you probably had that way in more than a. It went instrumental after that, much more instrumental. It was a good crossover though. But the, the, even the title "Metal Fatigue," that mm -hmm. the, the lead-in song, brought over different types. It wasn't just jazz; it had some metal. The time it was like it was like a mini riot, that was like Arr! with some great riffs, but it was so <laughs> you'd never heard it before. It's insane I, to this day. I'm like, how did he think? Like it was just no, it's, it's pretty brilliant. unique. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I I do a lot of stuff on dr on drumchannel.com, and I, I picked recently picked a couple um, pieces from that record, a tune called "Devil Take the Hindmost" and "Metal Fatigue." And I, I, I was watching you analyze my own drum analyze my own drum parts so drummers could figure out how to play that song because even "Metal Fatigue" is you listen to it, but it's it's quite complicated. Like there's yeah. a metric modulation, a tempo change, and then there's one to get back to the original tempo. When you listen to it, it's just it sounds like really cool music. Right. But guitar over over all these shifts that are that are happening, but yeah, I mean, the thing fits. really breathes. It's not. Um, I really loved playing with Alan. He had a very very organic way to write music. He wrote most of his tunes in rubato. I don't think he wrote that one rubato, although I think he wrote the two parts, like the the uh, faster part. It's almost like another tune, and it goes mm -hmm. back to the original original heavy metal riff and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, he had a very organic way. Not not he didn't really count through stuff. He just played it, and it was more of a feel thing and worked out counts for the ends of phrases. How many? How did you put your I'm parts going? in that kind of stuff? Were you? He was Kovari really open him. for me to do what I wanted to do. It was very, very rare when he would say, try something else. I don't remember him ever saying that. So, and pretty much the bass part too, although he would get together with the bass player, usually Jimmy. And, um, you know, he would often write this good, good guitar part and then would, they would like really mess with bass notes. Yeah. Which of course would change the chords. Because <laughs> since you change the, the, the root, 
the whole chord will set. But they were they worked great together, you know. But they yeah, where they come up with some really rich and interesting harmonies, you know. The albums are great. I mean, you played on like what eight albums with them, I think, right? With Alan, or, something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and Zappa, like I thought you did, like your your site said like twenty seven, but I thought actually at this point you probably with re releases now it's probably over thirty albums or something at this point. Could be, yeah. I haven't caught so up, much, so honest. much. You've done so much. You know, if you well, I just remember the you... first. You know, he had a recording truck that he bought right before I joined the band. He bought it from the Beach Boys and. He said, look, I'm going to record every gig and we'll might record some rehearsals or sound checks and these will be our records. And sure enough, the, after the first tour, the engineer told me, well, we have 10 albums worth of material in the vaults from the first tour. So, so you know, yes, I, and stuff is probably still coming out. You know, he just it he was incredibly prolific. Uh, I think it was, I don't know, yeah. I love her stuff. But you also play with Steve Vai and to get another phenomenal yeah we well, met steve and frank's band right steve is amazing super yeah. well so i met steve on in the band you know i met right. him in zappa's band we played a couple tours together and then um steve did his first record um and he called me up he said you want i just you know turn my garage into a kind of a humble and it was a very humble kind of makeshift studio on a you know a little fostex eight track analog quarter inch machine i think he had and I brought a drum set up to him just to use, you know. Yeah. And and um, I think he, he gave me a guitar, <laughs> you know, that day. <laughs> <laughs> it was just fun, you know, just for friends. Yeah. We so I played on a few a few of his tracks and, and we we've just stayed friends. I was on his label for a little little while there, Favorite Nations. I went put one record out with him. Oh no. You come from a a, a family of drummers. You have two I do one bass player, but my father was a was a drummer and music mostly a music teacher really uh, quite locally locally famous in orange county um he was a great jazz teacher and started a lot of programs had the first like elementary school big band in southern california That's um, awesome uh, yeah he was just a really great teacher and, and he used to put on these fundraiser concerts once a year you know and he'd have amazing artists would come down um, the first one we did was in 1973, I think it was, with Louis Belson, you know, the great Louis Belson. He came a few times, and Dad put a, you know, I don't think Louis even had a big band back then, and he, Dad put together a, a, like a big band of, of jazz teachers, his, his buddies, you know, and they rehearsed and worked on Louis's music and then did this concert, and the kids, we were in the kids' band, we, we played. And so he did that with um, so many groups. Uh, you know, instead of selling candy <laughs> for fundraising, <laughs> we wanted to go to the Reno Jazz Festival every year. That was the big international jazz festival in the States. And um, so that cost money to rent a bus and, you know, get all that happening. So he had Maynard Ferguson's band many times. He had um, Shelley Mann, uh, Louis, of course, Ed Shaughnessy, Chuck Flores, Cat Anderson, the great trumpet player from Duke Ellington's band, um, Bill Watros many times, Frank Rosalino. Um, Hampton Hawes, Carol Kay, I mean, just on and on. Gordon Goodwin, Fat Band, um, who's a buddy I grew up with, too. And how um, old were you at this time that you were I'm, having this influence in your life? Well, 73, I was 13, yeah. That's, so. a good, that's incredible to have that flowing through your life. Yeah, it was, it was, you know, we had an amazing father. So he was really Sounds open it. with music, too, and played a lot of music in the house, and it was a lot of big band stuff and a lot of like Miles Davis, John Coltrane. Um, then we both used to take from the same drum teachers. And so if the drum teacher would like recommend, you know, one, at one point one of our drum teachers said, you should really check out Ginger Baker, this band called Cream. He's a, like, he's he's actually a really good jazz drummer, but he's playing rock. You know, so we, so we got some Cream albums, you know, and then and he said, yeah, this other guy, Mitch Mitchell, he plays with Jimi Hendrix, but he's all, <laughs> you can hear, you can hear Elvin Jones in his playing, you know, check him out. He's improvising a lot. So we'd get some Hendrix records, you know. Really? So dad, dad was really open, yeah. yeah. Because it was not the music. experience you is... in a lot of your success too? I'm sorry, I mean, some of you. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, my parents would come to Zappa rehearsals and they would show up anytime I'd talk about a gig or something. They're like, we're there. <laughs> they would just come. You know, That's yeah, awesome. Incredibly yeah. supportive. And so I'm the oldest and Bob is a really amazing bass player and now a music producer. 
But you tease uh, him, right? Because he's a bass player. And you guys are all drummers. You gotta. No, no. Well, he got to play with everybody because he's, <laughs> he's a bass player. Get it with you because he's your brother. You gotta uh, tease him. Yeah, yeah. Then John is great. John's out in Las Vegas now. He's got his own studio. Um, but he used to play with Lindsey Buckingham and uh, Bunny Burnell, Brian Auger, um, all sorts of people. Um, and then Brooks plays in Avenged Sevenfold now. But he was yeah. in Bad Religion before and Suicidal Tendencies. He's played other. Lot, Quite a lineage there too. Big records, you know. Yeah. But yeah, that's my. That's my amazing. Your family there. <laughs> yeah, we just we, did a memorial for my dad. We did a big, 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 big band concert at one of the schools that he taught at, at OSHA in Orange County. It was really fun. Like a, we just got an all-star big band together. All of his his favorite players showed up. You know, Wayne Bergeron on lead trumpet and uh, Gordon Goodwin played sax. Tom Kubis, all these great Andy Martin on trombone and stuff. Quite That's an impact fun. he's he's had on the music industry. Yeah, my daughter sang and my niece sang. It was it was a it was a big success. It was really nice. That sounds beautiful. It sounds pretty awesome. One of the things I, I I try and I haven't been able to figure this out with you with some drummers and, I, and um, when I spoke to um, Bill Buford from from Yes and King Crimson stuff, he talked about yeah. He I build, know Bill. He, well, he would talk about he's so, he's so so nice. When I talked to him how he would build his drum sets. For the album and the tour, he wouldn't do it the other way. And some artists just have like a setup. And I'm not a drum guy, so I wouldn't know. But for him, he always designed it for that one project. You know what I mean? What is your approach when you when you do that? Is yours a different way or well? Similar? I kind of did that for a while, but and it's fine if you're on a big tour where you can take your stuff. But after a while, it, when I was playing with Alan, you know, it was all you go to Europe and it's, you have a rental kit. So I end up. It was like, okay, what what are the most common sizes that I can always get? So I, I yeah. went with that. It wasn't that different. So I, my kit shrunk, you know, because because of Practical. that. But I but I could get used to the same setup. You know, if we went to Japan or if we went to to France or Germany or Italy, you know. So it was kind of a, on a practical sense. If you yeah, if you're doing a big tour where you have a crew and you've got you're carrying your gear over to Europe or, you know, that's different. You can, you can do that. He was, you know, Bill was playing with the S and I'm sure King Crimson, they take, probably take their own stuff. You know. I'm sure he did. Yeah. I mean, he even yeah. talked about the time when they were, you know, it was his electronic drum phase and like, you know, how he built that yeah. special thing. And I mean, he, so, but to you, you're playing, I'm like, man, you're so, not even being a drummer, but just a I know you're like one of the, you know, like 10 drummers I can hear me. Like, I'm pretty sure I know who that is. Like, I can hear this, you know, you're playing in your style. Thank you. So uh -huh. you're welcome. So, but it's not always, but it's not always about the tools. You know, even Helen could pick up anybody's guitar. It would sound like Eddie. Anybody else couldn't pick up his guitar and sound like Eddie. So sometimes it's the touch. And that's, I guess, probably my roundabout way of asking you how your approach to your. A lot instrument. of it is the touch. Yeah. A lot of it is your musical choices and the space you leave or don't leave. And all. Yeah, it's, there's a lot involved for your sound. Uh, the instrument is definitely a part of it, and and you know when I get to play, uh, I mean I played have played DW drums for forty years now, and Piesty cymbals for forty years. They're they're I feel at home you know, because yeah. I'm hearing my my sound back and I, back and I I get inspired. That's where I think it really uh, makes musicians feel really comfortable. I know good, with guitarists, they're always in search of a tone, their their yes. their tone, and that can be like their guitar amp, the tubes they use, the kind of pickup, everything. Um, but once they're, you know, once they're feeling really comfortable with that, they, they will play better. You know, so it, it is, I mean, years and years ago, there was a party and a buddy of mine, uh, you know, had played a Fender Strat and had a Fender Twin Reverb, kind of very stock. Yeah. Both pieces are very, you know, pedestrian or kind of very typical yeah. and and alan holzer sat in with a band and it sounded like all the equipment had changed like nothing sounded like my buddy mike anymore <laughs> it sounded exactly like alan holdsworth even though all the gear was not he didn't use any of that stuff so it is touch it it, it is you know it's amazing a lot, to think about a lot of it is you know i mean but there is a thing about when you're playing your instrument as tuned the way you want it to, you, I think you will play better. You'll probably play longer. You know, you'll get more inspired because you love, yeah. love the sound that's coming back. And, and that's definitely a thing. But, but a huge percentage of is how you strike the note on the guitar or how you, you know, 
how you hit, you, hit a symbol. Yeah, that. You've learned to play. I heard how you maybe we could talk about it a little bit how you learned playing and beginning with, with the, um, your, your original lessons. How it would be like two weeks you learn how how dedicated and how relaxed it was for your your drumming ability in the process that you were taught initially. I was, I was really was, lucky to my my dad loved Louis Belson. That was his favorite drummer, and he wanted us, my dad, and my my I was the kid. Uh, to take lessons from Louis, and, and he wrote him a letter. Quick, make, make it a long story short. Yeah, just um, uh, wrote, Louis wrote back and said, "I'm just too busy. I'm got my big band now, and I'm working with my wife Pearl Bailey. And but I recommend my um, my drum teacher, who was, who was Murray Spivak. This guy was a, was a real legend, yeah. um, amazing brain, and taught hundreds of great drummers. But it was only on hands, it was reading in hands." That's all. And it was all about economy of motion and how to, he didn't teach style, didn't believe in teaching style, you know, <laughs> it was all just how to make a stroke. It was very, things were done in slow motion, but man, it really paid off because I, you know, uh, he yeah, just had this method. It was very smart um, where you could play with a lot of power without ever getting tired or, and, and not using much muscle even. So. So does that carry over that. now? Oh, you know, so that's my next question. That's that's what I was getting with it because clearly it's done so well for you as in your teacher and you offer lessons. So people please check them out and reach out to him for lessons. Do, that's yeah. a big goal of this. I mean, yeah, if I was a I'd reach out to you. <laughs> and I, I teach Murray Spivak's system. I did a, a, a you know like a 30 episode master class on on his system on drumchannel.com. Mm -hmm. So you you can get that there as well. Or I, I teach that's what I teach. Um, technique wise because it's just it, it makes music easy because your technique doesn't get in the way of your ideas you know it's a very uh it's a very smart way to to play it's it not sounds inspiring you know yeah he was he had an amazing brain he was also a sound engineer he had he was an innovator in sound recording early on like uh, he started off doing sound of he started off working as a drummer mallet player for RKO radio pre-television years and then when RKO moved to <laughs> Hollywood and started a film studio they they hired him to be the sound effects person because he was already doing sound effects he's building his own sound effects for RKO radio right. plays and shows and stuff so um but then eventually he got an, and so he did King Kong the original movie King Kong he was the sound effects artist for that and did very creative stuff to make the gorilla roar even you know he went to the zoo and recorded like a puma and a tiger or something else and then ran at his own voice but he ran his own voice backwards and, and did it to uh you know multiple uh, projectors because they weren't using tape machines back then they were they had a mag strip on each projector then he'd run off multiple projectors off one motor so he could multi-track before there was any multi-track i mean the guy was a super innovator Super brain, but yeah, and this master drum teacher, you know, he taught Louis Belson and Shelley Mann and Joe Morello and Vinnie Colaiuta and, and my, my, all my brothers and myself. And yeah, it was an amazing guy to know, but he was born in 1903. You know, he was fairly Absolutely. old when I took, when I took from him <laughs> and had really retired, good. retired from the film business. Um, and the movies he recorded, you know, he recorded Sound of Music, he recorded Hello, Dolly, he recorded West Side Story, like, you know, about 10 major, uh, really, major American know. epic films, yes. Talk about yeah. having your hand on a, the pulse of uh, American media. Yeah, he used to record the orchestra with, uh, I think it was five Omni mics, you know, and the very the mixers were very limited back then. But, but, but beautiful. You listen to Sound of Music, it's a gorgeous recording. Well, Zappa used to splice all the time because yeah. it was analog recording when I first joined. And then eventually uh, it was tape, but digital tape, you know, reel to reel, like right. big, big Sony machines. But first he had a couple of studers that he used, two inch, 24 track. But that was, a, that was a, so do you, they, they were, that, was a, that was an art form though, splicing with a razor blade. And then the, the machines mm -hmm. were always not always, sometimes they're off sync, just a, ha a tear, which would change everything, you know? Yeah. yeah. It was. They had to be really, really good, really creative. Um, he used to, uh, 
edit from city to city, you know, Frank would like, because he recorded live. So you go to his house and listen to some stuff. He's like, yeah, I would call him up after a tour just to check in, to say, how's it going? I said, quite a few times he was there. It's amazing. Come up here. And I want, I want you to hear what you did. Like, you know, I'm, I'm listening. And, and while we're listening to the track, he'll, he'll, he's saying like, Paris, Dallas, Berlin, Chicago, you know, he's talking <laughs> where the where the edits were from each city. And you couldn't tell and you yeah. drummed it, right? Yeah. If if the edits didn't work, I'd have to do the drum track again from these live stuff. And it was it was that was wild to do um, because you would if you hear, hear a cymbal crash you know, cut off because they just and they couldn't oh, find they, some of the things like recording wise that he kind of came up with on his own that are now you do it with like sampling or bits or building a song of a song library. He was writing his own songs and creating his own separate song library with other sounds off of sounds he was creating. <laughs> you right. know, <laughs> using your own stuff for a new sound library for something new. He just keeps building onto that, which is bananas. Yeah, yeah, he was amazing brain. You were on Thingfish, actually, maybe think of it, on Thingfish, which is probably the most controversial album, probably of his. <laughs> okay, uh-huh. <laughs> what was it like recording that? I mean, and it was different than any other oh, albums or what? It was, well, no, so, so a lot of the recordings I did, I didn't, it wasn't like we're recording this album. It's just, here's this tune. It's just and okay. you didn't know where it would show up. It might show up three, four or five years later okay. on, a, on a record. It wasn't, there wasn't even a concept. It was just tunes. So uh, it's a lot of an interesting stuff. album to me. You know what I mean? Like, I don't not like anything. I don't like, it's not a favorite album I put on, but it, it's it's so interesting to me, the album. I'm like, how, you know, where was this from, this concept? You know what I mean? So all the players usually can add up to it if he because he, he gives you creative freedom at times. So your part that you added, but the fact that you didn't even know yourself. <laughs> yeah. What, what was going to end up? You didn't know where it, where it would. You never knew. No. Fair enough. Or fair if enough. it would come out. Yeah. Yeah. In the later years, so you you end up t doing stuff with with, uh, with Harry, drum stuff together, and, and other people, the bands, and you've you've gone on, you've done um, well, Colin Hay, and I think Colin Hay, you, that was probably a connection when you did Men at Work, right? Uh, tour. Colin was a Zappa fan, and he heard us play at the Palate, at the uh, Palace. Um, what tour was that? '84. Yeah, I think we played three, three or five nights at the Palace in mm -hmm. in L.A. in Hollywood. And Colin Hay was there on his honeymoon and um, heard the band, and his band had basically broken up, uh, yeah. Men at Work, and so he was reforming with with he and the sax player we, we, they were the two main songwriters yeah they were greg, yeah. greg ham and colin hay so he was performing a band and asked me if i'd if i'd you know Why? do a tour so I, I did a tour which was um it was about a four month period i was with them i guess yeah so i was in australia for about four months and then uh, after that i did his first solo record which was called looking for jack Okay, I, I actually I didn't realize that. I've heard the album. I like it. Yeah. I didn't even realize you were on that. See, when I was something new. I love his music. I think he's a great songwriter. I think yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's under he under. He's a great songwriter. He's a great singer too. Oh, of course. That's assumed from mm -hmm. me. But I'm saying, but like, I don't even realize how good of a songwriter is because they think of the few hits back then. I'm like, he's still doing good music now. Sure. Yeah, you know, the he world's is. changed. Yeah, that's re really strong. Really strong You've songwriter. gone through a few. I have a couple of just questions before we wrap this up. But 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 like. For new musicians and new drummers coming out, you've gone through a different time period now musically where it's, it's changed. And I know people said talk about like you know it's like brands and stuff. I've heard actually talk about an interview, and and it's not really so much that. Like, what would your advice be for new drummers to kind of come out now? Like, as far as evolving to their sound, what should they listen to, practice? You, you know what I'm saying to become more of a well balanced player. I think it's the same. I, I mean, I, I think what, what I think what drummers should practice is the same as the stuff they always should have practiced. I mean, trends will come and go, and, mm -hmm. it, and it's pretty easy to to figure out what a, a style is if it's a sonic thing that makes it predominant, or is it a beat that makes it predominant. Um, I wouldn't just do that. I mean, for uh, for my students, I want them to be employable, and you know, you never know where you're going to end up. You never know who you're going to meet. You just play with a lot of people. Just play as many people as you can. You know, it's like Jim Kelter said. He he 
was a jazz player from Oklahoma City, moved to, to L.A. not liking rock and roll. And then he tried it. <laughs> I was like, oh, I kind of <laughs> like this, you know. <laughs> and then he's like one of the biggest rock drummers in life, you know. Uh, you just you just never know. So I mean, you have an open mind. And I guess I got that from my from my dad, you know, because he had a really open mind, yeah. especially with music. He just thought music was good or bad. And it, it was just his opinion, too. He, he appreciated other people's opinions. But, you know, if it hit him, it hit him. Um, I wouldn't be so concerned in, in one genre that's popular right now because it could go quick. Right. Too. Well, know, I, I meant you know, like as far as like, able... yeah, where to get your basics and your rudimentaries and like to, you know, get, get a teacher or go online. What's the best resources? Because I mean, I think you did the best by being in bands. I think kids, if any musician you are, and even though it's not cool, if you can be in a school band, especially a drummer, learn that yeah. music. I think there's a lot of great stuff to be learned in high school bands. Besides performance and yeah, for, music, for, I mean, for all sorts of reasons, for socializing yeah. and for for yeah. getting a tribe together. You know, if you you get friends, it's very social. Yeah. It's a and it's fun. I don't. I mean, I don't care if any everybody ends up being a professional musician. They shouldn't. It's fine, but have some fun in high school. You know, in junior yeah. high school, in elementary school, music's a great, great, healthy outlet. You know, it's it's really good for you in, in so many so many levels. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, get, it's pretty, I, there's some really good teachers around, you know, just, just a bit of research. There's, there's a lot of stuff online, but there's a lot of stuff, you know, go to the quality sites, go to drum channel, because there's a lot of great teaching there. Mm -hmm. If you want to dig deeper then get a private teacher, you know, go to you because there's nothing, you... there's nothing, well, or whoever, but, um, right. there's nothing like one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, you, you can. You can get a lot of a ton of information we couldn't get before, you know, bef before sites like right. Drum Channel. But but you know you can really it's amazing even hearing the roundtables, hearing like how a round table on drummers who are composers how they think. You know, it's fabulous. I love it. But you know it, it yeah you have access to all this stuff. Just don't go to the. There's too much stuff out there, you yeah. know. That's, well, that's I the asked you that. You can get you can get lost in it, so that's why I mean, go to the quality sites. Like go to you know, go to the ones where okay, you might have to pay a, a you know the amount of a, a couple Starbucks coffees a week or a month. You know, pay them a subscription a little bit and, and get the good stuff. You know, because you'll get just get lost and or get bad information too. Well, that's my There's point. Like, I don't know enough yeah. about drums, and my question to quote you is: we might be more pedestrian because I'm not a drummer. If we would be talking yeah. guitars. I guess, same as I guitar, could, but I'm know. saying I don't know how to how to point a, a young drummer who's like, there's so much out there. They're like, where do I go? What, what can I do? I want to yeah. be a drummer, but I don't have these resources. But I have that technology. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know how to point a young drummer or an older drummer starting new drums. You know what I mean? In a direction. Yeah. Well, I, in a well again, my way. favorite my favorite site is Drum Channel because That's you can perfect. learn perfect. learn how to read on there from from Ralph Humphrey and Joe Pacaro. You know, you can learn how to play a swing beat from Peter Erskine. You can hear him talk. You can hear his band. You can, you know, it's it's like, here it is. <laughs> that, that that's perfect. Go that's there. Perfect. You know, there's there's other good 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 um, drum educational sites too, but nothing is it goes as deep or it has a as much um, really depth depth to it as as the stuff Don Lombardi's doing at Drum Channel. You know, Terry Bozio explaining rhythm. Yeah, that sounds pretty awesome. It sounds like that's probably the best. I don't think you could. Neil, Neil Peart, you know, explaining how he's composing his drum solo for the Rush tour, you know, and and show it's right there. All that's the groove, awesome. great groove drummers, Kurt Buscara, you know, it's it's. I wish I had it. You know, we used to have to. My dad drove me an hour every two weeks to. Right. Uh, you know, then in between those lessons, I would go to Chuck Flores. So we'd drive an hour up the valley from, from Seal Beach, and um, and that that hour is precious. You know, that was really a big deal. Now there's stuff on. You turn your computer on. You know. Yeah, but you got to listen to the radio and talk to your dad that supported you doing music. That's precious. So, it is absolutely yeah. So I mean, you won lucky. either way. It was win-win. Um, uh, we were just incredibly lucky. Yeah, but he, he, you know, he really 
my, my father taught us to work hard because he saw a bunch of talented kids, you know, when, by being a teacher. Right. And, and he would say, well, some, and some, 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 some are more talented than others, but if they don't put in the work, the one that's a little less talented actually is more successful. Yeah. He saw that many times, you know, a lot of his That's players in elementary school, junior high school went on to be pros. You know, he started a lot of great musicians. <laughs> that is so awesome. 10, 11, you know, that is awesome. You know, the, the, his, his buddy, the, his buddy taught uh, the school that the Picaros went to, like the elementary school, you know, so he had Jeff Picaro in his band class, you know. So, that is yeah. insane. There's a, there's a, there's kind of like a good uh, book there. You guys like the, like a, a, a history there, of the. Kinda, you know, yeah, yeah. Maybe one day, yeah. Uh, Someday it'd be fantastic. Who was working on a, 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 it would be a short document, but a, but a documentary on on my father, a friend of mine, a cinematographer. So. Uh, oh, that'd be awesome. Uh, yeah, it's it'd be good. It it was it's a big project, but. Um, yeah, it would be good. It'll come out. I just have one last question for you. Is there anything like yeah. musically projects that you're working on people could check you out and support you with besides um, you teaching? What's happening? Um, this summer, I'm actually playing with a Zappa alumni band just for one gig. We're going to Germany for the Zappa and Ollie Festival. Oh, nice. Um, um, Who's in that band? Is it like Mike and those Robert, guys? Or? Uh, this one is, it's Band from Utopia, which has is an alumni band. Okay. So it's myself and Scott Tunis on bass. It's Robert yeah. Martin. He's Ray White on singing and playing guitar. Scott, I mean, um, of course, Robert sings amazingly too, plays sax and keys. Um, Jamie Kime, great guitar player. And um, guitar player I haven't played with before, who's done other Zappa stuff. Uh, Robbie Man Mangaro, Mangano, sorry, Robbie Mangaro. So I'm looking forward to playing with him. He's a great player too. All right. Awesome. Uh, that'll be fun. Uh, I do a lot of stuff for the Baked Potato in LA. Uh, play with Mitch Foreman's band, which is, you know, last version of that was uh, Brandon Fields, Jimmy Earl, and uh, Lenny Castro in percussion. Played with Stu Ham the other night with um, Alex Skolnick on, on guitar and Matt Rohde, great keyboard player. Um, I play with Mike Miller's band, Jimmy Johnson. Mike well, a lot of these are playing at the Baked Potato or are these other places? Uh, I usually play there maybe once a month, you know. That's just so people can check you out, you know. You know yeah, it is, it's it's a nice small place. It's it's like playing in a living room. <laughs> it's a really small place, but it's fun. Oh uh, yeah, I've only heard and, about um, it. I have a new studio, so I'm writing music now and working on that. A new album? It's been a while. It's been a long time. Yeah, I'm <laughs> slow. A hot minute. Well, Guns N' Roses can do it. You can do it, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Doing drum tracks for people, we're, you know, doing a lot of stuff in in the studio. So, okay. yeah, cool. Alfonso yeah, Johnson out... was here the other day playing on a track for his record. Jeez, um, you are busy, huh? Yeah, but it's nice people are coming here now because the studio is really great. It's, it's really it's a it's a dream. Had it took a couple of years yeah. to build it, but it's, to it's finally have one. Yeah. Well, actually, and I didn't even think of this. People, yeah, to scratch your service. Check out everything he's done. I mean, the, this crazy amount of music he's been on. So many different albums, but check out his solo albums too. I I actually listen to these solo you. albums. Yeah. Um, oh, thanks. Yeah, you're, you're very interesting. You have like uh, like four of them. You know, I don't want to keep up your deck to go for hours on your stuff, but I was trying to. Well, well, thanks. But yeah, if you check out my solo albums, uh, um, they're fabulous musicians on those. You know, it's I'm yeah. really proud of proud of each one of them. You should be. I'm hoping yeah. for another yeah. one. I was like, man, he's not had that yeah. in a while. I gotta ask him. I almost forgot. Good thing. As far as I got. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm starting to write write again now. So that'd be awesome. Well, well thank you, man, for being on the show. It's been very, very fun. Thanks for having me, Sean. Thank you.